Good evening. Thank you everyone for joining us, uh, particularly when there's so many webinars here, there and everywhere. But this one will be well worth your while. We've Mike's just showing the poll results there. So we've got um, predominantly registrars, but we've got a nice mix, got some consultant colleagues as well. And a lot of people from all over the place, predominantly from England, as we'd expect. So that's great. As I say, hopefully this one would definitely worth your while. As you all know by now, we're at authorhub.xyz, where our only goal is to provide uh, top quality free orthopedic education to you fine people. Um, and I guess to some spine surgeons as well. Um, I'm joking. We are across uh, all social media platforms. So please do follow us at Authorhub XYZ and do subscribe to our YouTube channel because we're adding video content all the time. We are now collecting the links to in one central hub for all the orthopedic podcasts in Authorhub. Uh, but I still have a special place in my heart for C1 Do One podcast, which is on Apple, Spotify, and every other podcast platform. As you can see, we've only got 42 ratings, which makes me quite sad. So please do subscribe and leave us a rating. The latest episode is well on its way to becoming our most downloaded episode ever. So please do check it out and even share it with non-orthopedic colleagues because there really is something for everyone. Tonight's webinar is brought to you um, in conjunction and collaboration with our colleagues at OIUK. And OIUK's goal is uh, pain-free movement for all. OIUK is a charitable organization who fund high quality research and education into musculoskeletal science. And you can find out more at uh, their website, as you can see here, and there's a QR code which you can play back. Just before we start tonight's session, I just want to bring your attention to the next few webinars. In a fortnight, we have a foot and ankle dream team, uh, if such a thing exists, talking about ankle fractures and Lisfranc frank injuries. And then we have two more webinars subsequent subsequent to that on limb reconstruction and resilience, uh, two separate sessions uh, rather than one on resilience in limb, limb reconstruction surgeons. And then we're gonna take a short summer hiatus where we're gonna be just finalizing a lot of new video content that we're bringing you. So to tonight, as a knee surgeon, I'm delighted that we'll be talking all things TKR from basic science up to practical tips. For some of you, this will reinforce and augment what you already know. Some people will actually may learn things that they never knew. And for some of you, there'll be some light bulb moments where you go, aha, aha, so that's why. But I'm certain that every single person is gonna learn at least one thing here that's gonna change their practice from uh, here on. We have dear friends and colleagues on the panel in Jay uh, Mahalakshmivala, Satish Kati, and Seb Dawson Bowling. So I'll get out of the way. Uh, please do get involved with the chat. Please do ask questions through the Q&A function. Bates and I are paying for it ourselves, so we may as well use it. Um, over to you, Jay. Can you see the screen, Cash and Mike? Yes, we can. That's great. It's full. Yeah, yeah. we've got we're on the uh, yeah. So okay, thank thank you very much, uh, Cash, uh, Mike, and Pete for the invitation. Uh, it's, I'm delighted uh, to be part of this excellent platform. I know we decided that we'll do the first part of my talk and most of our talks on the basic science of it, mainly for the FRC sort candidates, and then the surgical technique. And we'll try to stick to our time to do it within 15 minutes. So the first is a posterior cruciate substituting knee or CR knee. And what is the answer for the FRC sort table? Now, what am I doing there? So they'll start with this. So here I'm using the slot cut or the box cut for my posterior cruciate substituting knee. And I'm very clear that I'm a PS surgeon and I have been all my consultant years for the last 15 to 16 years and even my last few years uh, in my training years. And that was a legacy of Paul Allen, which we use as a standardized way of doing knees, which are PS knees. The question which we asked at your basic science level is that you've joined me as my consultant colleague and which knee will you use and why? Will you use a PS knee or a CR knee? And it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I know what Satish uses, but I, I, my friend uh, Seb, I'm not sure what he uses, but it doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong. The answer is justifying it on the table. And let's start by this. The first thing we'll say is say, I use this knee. So I will say I use a PS knee and then say, I do know that in the contemporary world literature, there's no evidence base to support one over the other. And then say, 
in adult reconstruction or in arthroplasty surgery, surgery I'm very clear that there's no long-term survival study sh to show the superiority over one over the other. There's no patient reported outcome measure to show the superiority of one of the other. But then add that, however, at the basic science level, I do know that the posture cruciate reglament is responsible for rollback. So just say that. And then say for rollback to occur in a normal knee, which is a virgin unreplaced knee, both the ACL and the PCL act together. And then say the word, this is responsible for traditional rollback. And why I want you to do was traditional is we need to know what traditional rollback is before we can go on to the newer concepts of newer rollback. So say in a normal knee, because it acts together. However, when we do a knee replacement surgery, every knee replacement, whether you're doing a CR or a PS knee, we do cut the ACL. And then say by cutting the ACL in lab studies or cinematic studies, unfortunately, the rollback is not truly the true rollback. It's a combination of, and then use the word, rollback and slide. But before that, just clarify what rollback is. So rollback is the posterior shift of the contact point as the knee flexes. So it's the posterior shift of the contact point as the knee flexes from flexion to extension. And if we cut the ACL, then as I said, there's a combination of roll and slide and use the word slide is detrimental. And therefore you can say, and I'm verbalizing the words for you because we can read it in textbooks. I'm just verbalizing it in easy manner that therefore I use a PS knee as the post and cam ensures a predictable rollback. And that happens depending where in the implant uh, it happens. And most of it will be about 70 to 80 degrees of the flexion. And then say, if you want to defend your CR situation, you can say, I do know that in long-term survival studies, it has made no difference. And however, in a cruciate retaining knee, because it's not made any difference in long-term survival studies, I still use it. And I do know that polyethylene is no longer flat like the old flat polys. It is more conforming than previously. So this is the basis of the answer at the basic science level, not on adult reconstruction, at the basic science level. And then we can move on and say that if we are using the argument for CR and PS, one of the things which I'm very particular about is that any CR surgeon will be balancing his knee perfectly and any, every PS surgeon will be balancing the knee perfectly. So please get out of the system of saying, oh, this knee is not balanced well, therefore let me jump to a PS. Okay, that's a wrong decision making. At the same time, for this question, the basis of is what I've said before, Everybody starts by saying, oh, in patellectomy we do it, or in RA we do it, but it forms a very, very small part of the practice. And that leads you on to the question of standardization. So we standardize all our knees and therefore you get good outcomes. That's the theme of the talk. And why I use the word traditional uh, uh, rollback is now you need to know, and I'm moving on to the next part of knee replacement philosophy, is there may be on MRI studies, the fact that there's a differential rollback. So that's the word you use again, there's a differential rollback where the medial femoral condyle is more fixed. And at the most, it'll start moving at about 120 degrees while the lateral femoral condyle moves or rotates more. And that could be the basis of what you tell the examiner for the basis of my medial pivot knee. And my further philosophy of that for single radius and multi-radius, my colleague Satish would cover. So that's where is my way of talking about the rationale of doing PS or CR and knee. And that moves on to my second part, which is the surgical part. Now for this, if you don't mind, forget the basic science of Viber, forget your FRSL exam. Imagine you're in the, in the theater with me. Imagine your theater anywhere else, hacking away on a knee and enjoying yourself. So once again, what I'm showing you is the Harlow way started by Paul Allen and both he and I propagate this. This is something which however senior you are, whatever level you are, when you come to Harlow with us, you'll do it only our, this way. It's not the correct way, but it's a very reproducible way. And that's why I do it. Obviously I have my own ways, which I'm gonna tell you now. 
It's not MIS and it's certainly not quartz bearing. Okay, so let's start. I use a clear isolation bag. I like to see the foot and ankle. Why? I don't want to see the foot particularly. I want to see the middle of the ankle. Most people use a crepe bandage. I like to use a clear plastic bag. Next, skin marking for the knees. Flexed up and a medial longitudinal incision. I always bias it medial to tibial tuberosity. Next, this is not explosion. Just orient yourself and I'll take a few seconds. You're looking at the knee from the top part, okay? And I always, so when you do a medial parapetella, so that's what I do, a traditional medial parapetella approach. I leave a small cuff of quadriceps tendon medially. Look at that, that's your small cuff kept medially. And when I come down, I like to have a gentle curve, okay? I don't like to have a cut or a level to see where I close in. So it's a gentle curve. And I use metalline blue for markers for skin, for my closure at this layer. So let's move on. In the approach itself, once again, orient yourself. This is the femur going down in that direction. This is the tibia over there. And the first thing I like to say is I come down on the tibia. So I'm a left-handed surgeon, it doesn't matter, but the first big incision or the exposing incision is to expose the femur. So you see the condyle first, and then you come down onto the tibia. So I don't like to come down from here coming up. I like to come down from the femur coming down. Orient yourselves again. That's your patella. That's the femur going there. That's my patella tendon. And that's my tibia. I'm standing here and medial is here. Now it's a common, very commonly, most surgeons will come down over here and cut the anterior horn of the medial meniscus and the medial meniscus will fly away here. It's not important, but try to do it that I try when you come down here, try not to cut the anterior horn of the medial meniscus, jump and start doing your periosteal or the capsular exposure over here. And so in other words, I try to get the junction of the synovium bet between the synovium and the meniscus and I go around the medial aspect of the knee. And the meniscus stays within the knee and I'm going round taking my medial periosteal sleeve. Once again, orient yourselves, that's my patella, patella tendon, femur there, tibia here, that's medial. I'm working medially and I'm going round up to the equator. So there are two questions and you can ask me that in the discussions with everyone is what is exposure, what is release? For time factors, I don't do elaborate on it now, but you, you have to go up to the equator and you need to be able to use your Bristol. I like to use this as a retractor. I don't like to jam it in powerfully. I just use it as a retractor to do sharp dissection round at the back. And then we come on to eversion of patella. I do that in extension and I cut the synovium between the patella and tibia, evert the patella and cut round the patella. So let me show it to you. So that I, I hold the patella with my hand there. And whenever you're struggling to evert the patella or mobilize your patella, the first thing you do is I cut the tissue between here, which is the vicinity of the fat pad to the femur, okay? And then if you're struggling with the eversion of the patella, most people will work here. So they'll try to work here, they'll try to work proximally. You don't have to. The main crux is to evert the patella and work around over here. Okay, so I work around here and I circumscribe the patella, so I evert it. And that allows me to flex up. Now, once I flex up, I'm very clear. My exposure, and remember, I'm still on exposure, is clear medial side, clear notch, clear lateral side. So let's do each one. The minute I bend up, so I flexed up straight away, I do what is called as a non-thinking step. I cut my ACL and the ACL is cut on the tibial side. All right, so I cut it here. Then I use my Bristow and I very gently try to get the tibia forward. I don't like forced external rotation and I don't like really pulling it forward. I like to gently get my tibia forward. So that's my further exposure. And then my medial exposure, now I remove my medial meniscus. So I remove that there. I use two homens, the straight one and the curvy one. The curvy one goes on the lateral and the straight one goes at the back. Now, once I've done this, the next is my notch exposure. Most people will use the notch exposure by using a nibbler. 
my advice to you, if you're a fantastic surgeon, you get your entry point right. If not, I use an osteotome always, whether there's osteophyte or not, I like a square target. And that's my square target I've made. And then I remove my PCL. It's much more elegant. It's much more so, and you get it much better. Once I've cleared that, let me go on to my lateral side. So the lateral exposure is done in three steps. And just to remind you, most people at this stage would start preparing a femur and tibia. But the philosophy is that you've not done your exposure yet because you've not done your lateral exposure. So may as well do it now. So I don't start on my femur. I don't start on my tibia. I still carry on with exposure. So lateral exposure is done in three distinct steps. I use a curved homin and I put it in the soft tissue there. And with my own hand, I don't give it to the assistant, my own hand, I keep this on stretch and I cut this tissue. And I always ask, what am I cutting? And that's your patellofemoral ligament. Don't say it's a lateral collateral. It's the patellofemoral ligament, which you cut. And that gives you a better starting exposure of the lateral part of your knee. So that's my first position of my homin. Then orient yourself. My second position of the homins is I position my homins on the outer aspect of my lateral meniscus. See that? That's your lateral meniscus seen there. That's the front, that's the back. I position on the outer aspect of the lateral meniscus. And then I remove the lateral meniscus in its entirely. Once again, not leaving any remnants behind. I can do that very elegantly. And third, I reposition my homins on the bone. Yeah, so that's my third position. And still I do not stop. The landmarks for me is I clear the 10 millimeters of the lateral side. And whenever I do this, everybody says, oh, you're doing a release, it's a various knee. No, I'm not doing any release. So far, everything is exposure. You're gonna cut the 10 millimeters of the good side, so may as well do it now. And I stop only when I see my popliteus tendon. See that? That's the popliteus tendon. And I look at the, and I get a complete orientation of my posterior lateral corner because that's my guide to doing a good knee. And that's when my exposure finishes. So I'll end with, how does it matter? It, it's important because when it comes to releasing osteophytes, which is a main issues now, which we've realized are the balancing problems in a knee, it's easy. For example, how do I get from here to here? So I don't want this spitting out. I want to get from here. I want to get to here. So with the exposure, I can do whatever I want. I can use a osteotome, I can use a bristol for the capsule, I can use sharp dissection at the back, and I can clear both laterally and medially. There's been no differential issue there. Second, difficult situations like obese patients, and this is leading on to my questions in my case I put forward, is it doesn't have, it's not a problem. It's straightforward because we, I do it all the time in this particular exposure. And most importantly, it leads to perfect balancing, it leads to perfect implantation, perfect cementing, and that sticks to the theme of the talk is improving outcomes. So my message would be standardization of all your arthroplasty work, as well as true correct exposure to get the ultimate balancing, which my two colleagues, Satish and Seb, are gonna talk on. Thank you very much. Awesome, Jay, thank you very much. That was awesome. Jay, um, one thing I like about it is one of the things that one of, a guy, I worked with a guy called Mick Pierce, I mean, when I was training at Charing Cross, and Mick always said, make, sorry, Mr. Pierce always said, make every operation the same. And that's how you get reliable, rep reproducible results. Right. Yeah. Thanks for that, Cash. And I'm very, we are, I'm very particular about that. I mean, it's really, I, I like to stand in the same way. I like my trainee to stand in a way. It comes down to that. And I can, we can do it for arthroplasty. You can't do it for trauma. But I think arthroplasty, I think is very important. Right. Jay, um, Wahid Abdul wants to know, uh, what are your thoughts on preserving the fat pad? Uh, that's a good question. If you looked at my slides, they are true real life slides. Okay, so I'm not, it's exactly what I would do tomorrow or whenever I'm allowed to start operating again. And with this exposure I've done, people quite feel sometimes it's, it's a large exposure. It is, but it's not really, it's, it's a correct exposure. However, the fat pad is not something I formally remove at all. Okay, I okay. remove the part which I believe comes in the way in my first slide for eversion of patella. So I cut the tissue between the, which is part of the fat pad between the tissue and the femur, but definitely no formal excision of the fat, fat pad. You can get a good exposure of your tibia for getting your jig on without doing it. 
I believe it's, if you ask why, there's no need to in this exposure. And secondly, I think the pain which sometimes you get on that lateral is, is not there, but I can't, there's no evidence based for that at all. Yeah. And there's certainly some suggestion that that can cause a lot of that. It can cause some patella baja or some scarring yeah. the front of the knee if you excise the whole thing. Exactly. I mean, the fat pad is, Andy Williams says, is the cause of all evil in the knee. Yeah, that's why we don't. I really don't do it as a formal. And people are quite surprised. You do such a extent, you such a, a, a exposure. But how come you're not doing this fat pad? And it's exactly what he said, Cash. There's no need to. It, it's best to preserve it. And Jay, why the meniscus? Why, why do you save it for last, like a little bit of dessert? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's not important, and but it's elegant. That's number one. But more importantly, Cash, you agree that when you cut your anterior horn, the meniscus moves outwards into the soft tissue, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then you hold on to it with a cocker, and you then you cut it off either then. Uh, you can ask Satish how he does. He has an elegant way of doing it, but in extension. But you agree that it's an issue of getting the whole thing off if it goes away. Absolutely. Now, if, you, if you leave it inside, right, by getting the junction between the synovium and the meniscus, then you can get that whole meniscus out without an issue. So it's not flown away into the soft tissue. Understood. The reason why I tell my trainees the first 10 or 15 cash, I make them do the traditional way that you cut the anterior horn, let it go away. The reason is that in your quest for keeping your meniscus inside the knee, you really shouldn't be straying or fraying into medial collateral territory. You know what I mean? Yeah, you, I know it's the biggest risk sin, right? Yeah, so, so you don't, I mean, you don't go into soft tissue. It doesn't happen, but I'm just saying that uh, you can avoid it because you're very close to the bone, but you need to convince yourself you can do it and keep the meniscus there. But it's not going to change any long-term evidence-based outcome to your knee, but it's a nice way of doing it. No, that's nice. Jay, the other question that, that, that's come up that comes up regularly is the, the whole issue of bone stock preservation mm -hmm. with, between cruciate retaining and, and posterior stabilized, particularly in smaller femurs. Sure. And the risk of potential fracture at time of revision. Sure. So what are your point. thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm, yeah, it's like this. The one of the issues is that in a small knee, you'll get a fracture, and therefore should we avoid it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you stick to the philosophy of doing a knee because it needs to be standardized, then that shouldn't come in the way. The risk would, would be there, but my feeling is that risk is not of a supracondylar fracture. That's the main issue. The yeah. fractures you get is condylar fractures, right? Yeah. Now, what I've started doing is when you put your slot cutter on, you know, the, the, jig, the jig on, the pins which go in, and Moch traditionally can use my PFC or use any of the other implant companies, the anterior pin, right, are long pins. Hmm. You know, the ones which go into the anterior cortex. So yeah, I've yeah. started using those anterior cortex pins as the sh short pins, okay? So I believe if you go on making too many holes in that area in the small bones, that's when you get the fracture. So I've stopped using long pins over there. And secondly, is when you're cutting down, when you're coming down to cut down to remove the bone, don't move your hand off the saw. You see, you undercut into the condyles and that's yeah. when you get a fracture. So my feeling is paying attention to detail and making sure that fracture doesn't happen. So the way I can avoid the fracture is one, short pins, two, don't move your hand when you're using your saw. And the third point is when you're making your side cuts, you know, the side cuts of the box, if that's not cut adequately, when you put your trial insert on, that's when a fracture happens. So it's happened to me, but these are the ways because I'm such a PS surgeon for so many years, this is what I've started doing to avoid it. Okay. And, and has there ever been of stock cash, the last thing about preservation of bone, yeah. when you come to do revisions, you, me, all of us who do revisions, it is no real answer that, you're, that we have to use a sleeve for someone with a PS, you know? It depends yeah. on your osteolysis. It won't depend on this. So I can't believe that removing that bit of bone is going to make a difference when I come to do a revision. Okay. And, and has there ever been a time where you've thought, where you've said, this femur is too small, I'm going to go CR, I'm going to abandon my PS principles? No, I don't. Not, not at all. I, I use a one and a half very often, and I really don't oversize in those knees. So in those knees, actually, Cash, I would do the opposite of most others do. That in the, my problem, because I, I feel my unhappy knees, every one of us has unhappy knees. If you look at unhappy knees, those, they would have been the small knees when your quest for worry about all these things of fractures, you've 
oversized. You know, you've got to size a little more. So That's I fun. tend to go for the perfect size and I do, I use a 1.5. I'm comfortable with that kit and I use it. So the answer is not even once. Okay. And one last question for you, Jay, and we'll let you go is, do you, is this your exact same approach for your revision, so revision arthroplasty? No, revision uh, to a certain, revision is divided into exposure, removal implants and reimplantation. And for revisions, I would do the same. And I really feel that because I do it in this manner, the amount of times, if you're asking the next question, do I have to use my tibial tuberosity, you know, tubical osteotomy, or do I use rectus nip all the time? My feeling is because we do it like this and we do it all the time, the times I have to do those is much, much less. Yeah. So it's the same exposure, but different principles of skin management. Yeah. And the thing I didn't mention is flaps, which I don't want to get into a flap. The message would be elegant skin handling. Yeah. Delicate skin handling. That, that, that's what it would be. Yeah. You've clearly never seen me operate then. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Um, well, so I'll put, we'll, we'll pass you on to teach now. We've got hundreds of questions. Yeah. Um, uh, we'll, we will spread those out, otherwise it'll be no one else will get a chance to talk. So Satish, please could you uh, come on with your slide? And single radius, as we predicted, there's been a few questions about that already. And other things to think about for the panel, people want to know if you go femur first or tibia first. So I'm curious to hear. Satish, you just need to unmute yourself. Right. Yeah, I'm on mute now. Perfect. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Uh, right. So, Perfect. Cash, Mike, thank you. Uh, it's uh, been a real pleasure to be part of this uh, uh, group uh, today. Uh, my remit, I thought, was slightly different. Uh, Jay, what Jay is talking about is the bedrock um, and the, the foundation on which knee has been built. Uh, knee replacements has been built over the years, but what I'm going to talk is slightly different. Uh, and many of you may think, well, what the hell is he talking about? Uh, yeah, feel free to shoot me at the end. So in terms of... Um, I'm not moving. Oh, there. Okay. In terms of disclosures, uh, was the implant I talk about is part of my remit with uh, Stryker. So where are we? I don't need to tell you where Hollow is and what it's famous for. Uh, Jeffrey Fisk was one of our first consultants there in, and he introduced lead hand to the world. And those are my colleagues there. Um, in terms, of, we still talk about satisfaction and that's the real problem, isn't it? In terms of knee replacements, uh, unhappy knees, uh, unhappy patients, and often quoted as 80, 20, 20 aren't satisfied. Big numbers, um, uh, but many people feel that it's actually more. It's 75, 25 split. It's quite a lot. And you need to think why is that those patients are not happy. And as Einstein always said, you should never stop questioning as to why things are not happening uh, because curiosity has its own reason for existing. So I ask all my uh, registers, do you think all replacements are the same? And when I was training, I felt they all looked the same and they would, they would they look exactly the same. I didn't have an idea whether one was different for the other, but let me tell you that they are different. So you need to understand the implant design philosophy of each implant that you put in. Uh, you need to question that. Uh, you need to understand its philosophy because surgical techniques do vary with each implant, uh, which I learned over, over a period of time. And actually technique does influence your outcome. Uh, you may ask how, and you're asking a need to do this. It's quite a need replacement to do this. And that's complex amount of movement that happens uh, in, uh, in a knee, uh, both normal and arthritic. Uh, so what I was going to go through is what is multi-radius, what is single design philosophy, uh, sizing mismatch, and that is between the tibia and the femur, Jay's touched on it a little bit, does it matter? Um, restoring offset, um, there is an offset in hips, but there is an offset in knees too, and why is that important? So talk about multi-radius, so we need to go back to history, and where did all this start, and uh, how did we get where we are? Uh, so what you see on your screen on your left is uh, John Insel uh, on the left with Al Burstein, the engineer there at the laboratory in HSS in New York. And they came up with, the, with this design, the uh, geocondylar knee. Um, and I didn't ask myself, it was only when I was doing my fellowship that I realized why, how, why and how did they come up with this design? The tibia you can understand, it's flat and you make a dish uh, to incorporate the femoral component, but how did the femoral component design come about? And it goes down to this very uh, seminal paper way back in the 1970s. Yes, 1970s. 
And I was thinking, what did we have in the 70s? We had these scan discs. We had uh, the famous Sony Walkman came in and this big so-called mobile phones at that point. That's what we used in the 70s. And with this paper, how they uh, came about was using x-rays. And I'd encourage you to read this paper. Uh, I can't go through the details of it. And what came about at the end of this paper was this J curve. And this is the bedrock or um, the design uh, or the basis of design of most modern or most total knee femoral components. Um, uh, and this is how it is. So the, the radius of curvature gradually reduces. Uh, and as many have would have heard, you've got this mid flexion instability because from a very large radia, you suddenly go very small and you feel the sense of instability as the, as the knee flexes uh, uh, or, or, as the knees, uh, or as the patient starts to flex the knee. Especially while going downstairs, you, you find that some of these patients, uh, instead of going down uh, one uh, uh, leg at a time, they go sideways. Um, and it has its problems. Uh, they consider that the distal femur looked like an egg uh, and it had a, got a paradoxical rollback. And Jay talked about the classic rollback uh, where the medial side is fixed and the lateral side uh, rotates posteriorly. That's how a normal knee should. Whereas in, in this, the knee moved forward and that's what was called a paradoxical rollback. Lo and behold, we fast forward to 2000s, and uh, that's Mike Freeman and Vera Pinskarova uh, that you see, uh, who came up with the modern design. And they, they studied uh, MRI scans uh, of how the knee moves, and they found that actually it's not multi radius. It's actually they, they, they wrote, the knee actually flexes through a single axis, which is your trans epicondyl axis. Uh, and what do we have in 2000s? We moved away from the scan disk. We have uh, a much better phone nowadays. And the two pictures below are how things have evolved and we should embrace what is actually modern and, and actually much more works uh, in needs to. So the left is when Pope John Paul was uh, announced to the world and the Vatican as the new Pope. And on the right is Pope Benedict. And you can see how technology has evolved. So what did they say? They, they found that the medial side was more or less fixed. And if you do knee arthroscopy, you'll find that the medial meniscus is quite rigid, very little movement. And so that's, where, that's, that's why that helps in stabilizing. And it's, uh, the medial side is dished. Uh, whereas you look at the lateral side, it's actually domed. And that's where the rollback happens posteriorly. Uh, and as the knee flexes more and more, uh, the lateral meniscus, as you can see on this, uh, the, the MRI image, literally comes off and the femur comes off the femur. Um, uh, the femur comes off the tibia, sorry. Uh, and if you do arthroscopy, you will find that um, the popliteal hiatus is the area where, through which this, this happens. So the lateral meniscus acts like a sling, bringing the femur back in as you extend. Uh, and they, had, they, they came up with three arcs, uh, regardless of the shape of the femur or the tibia, where the the most important arc of flexion was the, or the functional flexion was 10 to 110. That was a, occurs through a single radius or a single arc. And then you have further deflection, which happens beyond that. Uh, and uh, beyond ex, uh, 10 degrees, uh, you get the extension part. So knee replacement design actually is for a single radius uh, design features are based on that particular single arc. Uh, not just uh, Mike Freeman and uh, Pinskarova, others too have, uh, have, have explored this and they found that the, the Nakamura group uh, found that, again, it's a single axis through which the knee moves. Um, and this is Ekhoff, uh, a scientist who, who does regular work in these kind of modeling. And he came up with that uh, the distal femur in his modeling that it's like a cylinder and therefore the axis happens uh, through that single radius. And that is why single radius actually uh, feels more normal uh, in terms of thinking as this as did Stephen Howell. Uh, so these are independent people who have verified what Mark Freeman and Pinskarova have found. And the same, uh, so if you compare now with historical or traditional uh, thinking as to how the, the knee should move, uh, they moved from the egg to the more modern concept of where the distal femur is actually uh, a single radius uh, through which the knee flexes and extends. A few then ask me, what's the difference? We, we, the single multi-radius designs do work. Yes, they do work. And that is what we've been taught. Uh, but if you look at evidence, and this is a prospective randomized trial from the Edinburgh group, 
looking at multi-radius versus single radius. It's a clear, clear difference in that the single radius works better than the multi-radius. Uh, so there is evidence and there are other uh, papers uh, in uh, the annals of uh, Royal College uh, from uh, Mike Whitehouse showing that it does make a dif uh, big difference uh, in terms of outcomes comparing single to multiple. Sizing mismatch. Now this is a little controversial, but there is some evidence. Now, when I say mismatch, saying a, a size four tibia, for example, articulating with a size five femur. Uh, so it, it does matter uh, in my experience, and I'll show you why. So if you cut your distal femur perpendicular to the, uh, um, to the shaft, you get an X size. Now, if you flex that cut, actually it sizes one size down. Uh, and if you extend that cut, it actually one size up. So, and we've been taught that you should never flex your distal femur cut because your femoral component goes into flexion. And if you flex your femoral component, you have a problem with the extension. So if you now apply this to single radius, it actually does work. So because the femoral component is, a, a, is around a single radius, so you can flex your femoral component and therefore size is equal to what the tibia is uh, and therefore mismatches are much, much less. Uh, so if you look at this x-ray, the AP view, um, uh, not the AP, the lateral shows that the femoral component is in flexion because the distal femoral cut is, uh, is not perpendicular to the shaft. And you can see how nicely it sits within the contour of the distal femur and there is no problem with extension. And this is a study from uh, Steve Logan in uh, the US showing that uh, if you flex your component using a flexible rod, and this is outside the remit of this talk, uh, you can get much, the sizes are much more bunched and closer to where it should be. And the outcome in terms of pain and satisfaction is much better when the sizes are the same. Uh, not surprisingly, because if you oversize your femur, uh, you get uh, discomfort laterally, as was shown by uh, Ormod Mahoney, uh, overhang by a few millimeters on either side can cause pain and satisfaction uh, rates are quite, are quite down. And therefore you, you would think if the satisfaction is down, patient continues to have pain, no wonder revision rates may be up. And this is now anecdotal. Uh, I don't have evidence for this, but certainly it's pointing towards a problem uh, that if there is a mismatch and typically happens in the femur, uh, that you can get uh, unsatisfied patients. And therefore remember, uh, that you, you should not get any overhang laterally. And on the tibial side also, this is courtesy of Michel Bonin from uh, the Arthur group where, where, and what he's got, he's got a, he's di he's injected dye around the popliteus is that as Jay showed, you've got to expose the postal lateral corner really well uh, to make sure that there is no overhang of your tibia, tibial component, because as soon as you overhang, you will rub against the uh, popliteus and these patients are not happy. Uh, so your tibial component should be just inside the edge of uh, uh, the lateral uh, tibial plateau. Restoring offset, I'm a hip surgeon, I'm a hip surgeon too. Uh, off, uh, the, the, the thing we all aim for in hip surgery is restore leg length and offset. And in, in, fee, in the knees too, there is an offset and that's called the posterior condor offset. And this is the seminal paper from uh, Berlin's, uh, Belgium where he showed that if you reduce your offset by two millimeters compared to before, you reduce, your flexion is reduced by 12 degrees. Quite a lot, isn't it? Uh, so, and often when you're stuck between sizes, when you're trying to do your femur, uh, most of your knee implant companies give you the option of moving your femoral component and uh, superiorly or anteriorly, and therefore you take more bone from posterior. That's not good. You increase your flexion gap, and also you reduce your flexion, and the patients are not very happy. So what is PCO? It's the distance between the posterior part of the distal femur and the posterior condyles, and that is your posterior condyle offset. So, and you can see the, the one at the top, which is a uh, multi-radius knee, and it's, it's taking a lot of bone from the posterior condyles, and its offset is reduced. And these patients, uh, this patient had reduced flexion compared to the one below, which is a single radius design where you uh, flex the component, but you maintain your offset the distance between the posterior uh, border of the distal femur and the posterior condyles. So you're restored and this patient has excellent function in terms of flexion. Uh, 
if you take more bone off, this is what happens, you impinge. And that's a real problem for these patients. So just remember when you take more bone off posteriorly that you're reducing flexion and the patients are not very happy. So in summary, I've just talked about some uh, uh, thought processes that outside what Jay has put in terms of the bedrock of what you should know in terms of multi-radius versus single design and how they came about. Uh, sizing mismatch, does it matter? It does matter. So think uh, about how, where you place your femoral component, avoid lateral overhangs and, and do restore the femoral off offset. It is very important. Thank you. Thanks, Satish. That was a really elegant demonstration of the single radius, which not everyone can visualize. Uh, interestingly, um, a lot of people are asking about anterior and posterior referencing. You've explained it nicely there. I, I'm assuming you're a posterior referencing you, your man yourself. Yes, that's right. Um, now, the, the thought process behind anterior and posterior referencing is that many people think anteriorly because they, they, they are concerned about notching. Yeah. Uh, and that's the reason why a lot of designs have come about uh, using your anterior cortex as a reference point for sizing. Uh, but I would encourage you to consider posterior referencing uh, because most current designs have got the flange that you take the anterior cortex, when you put the saw through, it, it goes at a much steeper angle. So your chances of notching, as you've seen in my uh, x-ray, is very, very little. That's great. Out of interest, do you do, you do femur first or tibia first? I do tibia first. Okay. I'm curious, just Jay and Seb, uh, people are asking, I'm just curious what you guys do. I do femur first myself. Um, Seb? The reason I do tibia first is because it, it creates a lot of space for me to do my tibia, my femur properly. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you're struggling to put your femoral uh, jigs, etc. So I, I feel that do the tibia first, it creates space, and then you can do your femur. Sure, thank you. And Seb? I tend to do the femur first, um, unless, uh, as Jesus said, if, if, if there's a difficulty uh, in particular kind of getting to the back of the femur to do the posterior cuts, then, then I might, after I've done my distal femoral reception, then sublux the tibia forwards and, and reset that before completing the, the rest of the, the chamfer cuts and so on. Thanks. And, and Jay, how about you? Yeah, Gash, it's a good question. And I think for that, the, the, the I, if you ask practically what I do, I do cut the proximal tibia first, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason I do it is for a practical reason, is once I do that, I get my femoral orientation, rotation, things easier, right? Mm -hmm. But from the philosophy of doing it, I'm a modified resection surgeon. So I use my implants to balance, right? So when I say I'm a tibia first, I'm just cutting the tibia. I don't use the proximal tibia for gap balancing. And that's the important okay. message I want to give to you, you know, that the people who are true gap balancers, right, will cut the tibia and that will be where they'll reference off to get everything else right. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the true gap balancers. I cut the tibia, but I'm not using that as my reference point for getting anything right. I will use my components to balance, which is that that is what I'm doing, a combined resection method of balancing, which you can talk about later if you want. But okay. practically, I do my tibia first and move on to my femur. Thank you. And I think Seb will touch on that as well. Yeah. Satish, would you mind please just telling, um, to, just talking about the difference between mechanically and kinematically aligned knees? Because Stephen Howell's always been very big on kinematically aligned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we tried to do kind of when I was at Oxford, they were talking about doing kinematic line knee replacements. They did some then. Mm. And could you mind, would you mind just explain to everyone what, what the difference is and why one might consider that? I think that the, isn't that part of Seb's talk? He's talking about alignment. Um, it, that is the plan. Seb seems to have disappeared <laughs> right now. Um, well, there's a question. Okay, we'll come back to that. We'll do yeah. that after Seb. One more question for you. If you, Jay, you're a PS guy as well, being a hard look? Yeah, I'm mostly PS, uh, but my, as, as, you, as the question was raised earlier about mm -hmm. small knees, uh, because the implant I use, the box cut is the same regardless of the size of the implant. Yeah. So I, I feel that yeah, I, I am uh, very close to uh, condylar fractures uh, happening. No, not, not that it has happened. So in yeah. sizes one and two, I use a cruciate retaining implant. But even yeah. if the cruciate's not functioning, there are uh, specialist, specialized dish inserts that you could use uh, that act like uh, a lip anteriorly to prevent for anterior slide. Thank you. Jay, you talked about, um, if ever you, you said you've had a couple of, you've seen a couple of fractures. Yeah. Um, 
when you do, do you get do you go straight to a stemmed implant? There are two things. First is, uh, yes, are you stabilized that fracture in whatever way it is? First question is, have you recognized it intraoperatively or have you recognized it in the post-op x-rays? If you recognize intraoperatively, decide whether the condyle needs fixation or not, right? And if it does, uh, then very often I, because we have stems on the shelf, I'll use a stemmed implant. Right. Uh, so the answer is yes. But in the ones which you've recognized, you know, as a crack post-operatively, then obviously it's not an answer. Understood. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Um, we're going to go over to Seb. Um, and then, so Seb, please, yeah, join us. You gave me a heart attack, Seb, when you disappeared, mm. but uh, I'm glad that you're back. Here we go. Brilliant. Um, so, guys, my, my colleague and our network lead over here at BART, Sebastian Dawson Bowling. Uh, Seb has written, I say normally, but he has literally written textbooks. Um, and so, interested to hear this. And Seb, you'll touch on kinematic and uh, mechanical alignment as well, will you? Uh, a little bit. Maybe we'll discuss that more in the uh, Q&A. Yeah, that'd be perfect. Well, we'll do, we'll, 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 let's have that as a roundtable discussion at the end. Off you go, sir. Thanks very much, Tash, uh, and the rest of the Orbit Hub team for uh, the welcome. Uh, thanks to uh, Jay and Satish for the excellent talks as well. Um, I, can I just, before I start, I'll quickly pick up on a couple of points that, that were, were raised in the other two talks. So first, I absolutely agree with the importance of doing really good exposure. I agree with the point that, that, that doing a big exposure does not mean that you're overdoing your releases. What you're doing is making sure you understand both the bony and the soft tissue anatomy before you start doing your, your bony resections. And I think that's absolutely key. And in particular, I like the comment that, that both of the other two speakers made about the importance of knowing where the posterior lateral corner of the, the tibia is. Um, I agree both to avoid overhang. And also, I think in, in terms of determining the, the rotation of the tibial component, which is really key to the tracking of the telephemoral joints, you can actually see the whole of the tibia properly, then it makes it much, much easier to, to get that right. Uh, and then secondly, Satish, I agree with you about the importance of understanding and, and for the, the audience, it is an important point. Uh, some posterior stabilized femoral components, depending on which system we're using, the size of the uh, box cut changes depending on the size of the, uh, sorry, of the femoral components. Uh, others, it's standard. So relatively speaking, you're taking away more of the bone when you do your box cut if you're using a, 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 a smaller femoral component as opposed to a bigger one. And those ones are the ones where you need to be particularly cautious about the risk of, of fracture. Um, and, and final point, interestingly, I mean, Satish mentioned then the importance of understanding uh, what's happening to the PCL. Uh, there is some research that shows that actually, uh, A, when you think you're preserving the PCL, uh, you aren't always. Uh, and, and, and the same uh, authors have also shown that actually, if you're doing a cruciate retaining knee and you think you preserve the PCL, but you haven't, it actually seems to make relatively little difference to the, the functional outcome of the knee replacement. So food for thought and perhaps a little bit controversial. Anyway, um, thank you very much. I'll move on to my own talk now. Uh, there's quite a lot to get through. I'm aware of the time, so I may uh, scoot over some bits, especially things that have already been covered by my uh, colleagues. Um, there'll be a kind of a, a slight blurring of the boundaries between the, the, the basic science and, and the more clinical stuff. Um, it's pretty obvious that we need to understand the biomechanics of the knee, uh, both in terms of the native knee and the, uh, the replaced knee, uh, so that we can preserve and try and restore the functional anatomy. Uh, bearing in mind that no new replacement on, on the market globally uh, completely mimics the uh, kinematics of the native knee. Nevertheless, it's helpful for us to try and understand uh, so we can at least approximate to, to some degree of, of recreation of that. Uh, and if we get it right, then uh, essentially the implant will last longer and the patient will be happier. And for what it's worth, uh, those of you who've got exams coming up, you know, the principles of how to do a total knee replacement, all the stuff that you've already heard from the other two speakers and also what I'm going to cover is, is actually kind of bread and butter. Uh, it's a predictable question. It's a good question in some regards if you get asked. Do you need to know it really well? So what are we going to talk about? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the anatomy of the native knee. Uh, what are the alignment goals of the prosthetic knee? Uh, how do we achieve soft tissue balancing, uh, both in terms of flexion slash extension and also medial to lateral? And then we'll talk about some of the practical aspects of how to achieve that. This is quite a, a, a like a dry question, but how many degrees of freedom are in the native knee? Uh, what is a, a degree of freedom? Essentially, it's, it's, a, it's a, a factor that allows you to describe uh, accurately where one body is in, in, in three dimensions. So if you're looking, for example, at the, the, the femur and the tibia relative to one another, uh, the answer is that there are six, uh, uh, three uh, rotational planes and three translational planes, uh, sagittal, axial, and, and coronal. Very quickly, uh, what does that actually mean? So in, in the sagittal plane, uh, rotation essentially is flexion and extension. You can also have a degree of uh, AP translation, the theme is sliding forwards, but that's translation, previous one is rotation. 
you go to the coronal plane, exactly the same. So, so you need to have a degree of varus valgus uh, laxity, um, although not too much. Uh, and similarly, the, the knee should be able to, to translate a little bit in the, in the coronal plane. And uh, finally, in the axial plane, uh, clearly the femur needs to be able to, to, to sublock very gently, a few millimeters at least from uh, medial to lateral on the tibial plateau. Uh, and similarly, uh, we need a degree of uh, tibial femoral rotation, especially when the knee is slightly uh, flexed. Um, and that is relevant because we, we, need, we need to, to bear that in mind, both in terms of how we do our knee replacements and also understanding the potential limitations that some implant choices have on, on, on the maintenance of those degrees of freedom. Anatomy of the distal femur. Again, sorry, this is slightly dry, but we do need to know it. But the anatomical axis of the femur is in about six degrees of valgus compared with the uh, mechanical axis. In a minute, I'll show you the diagram, show what I mean. The condyles uh, project posteriorly, as we've already seen from Satish's slides, um, but they're almost flush with the anterior cortex of the femur. Uh, and this means that, as, as we've already seen, again, when, when the knee is flexed, uh, the, the posterior condylar offset allows uh, the, knee, the, the knee, sorry, the posterior distal femoral cortex not to impinge against the tibial plateau. And so here we are, you can see the anatomical axis there compared to the mechanical axis, the mechanical axis passes through the center of the femoral head and then through the center of the knee, and there's somewhere between five and seven degrees there. Those of you who know me will realize I'm, I'm pretty tall, so mine's probably more like five degrees. Uh, somebody who's short, uh, probably more like seven, most people are somewhere in between. Uh, and then again, uh, similar to what Satish has just shown you, so, so this uh, posterior condylar offset combined with, with the rollback we've also heard about uh, allows us, us to achieve pretty deep flexion uh, before any contact becomes between the, the posterior aspect of the tibial plateau and the posterior uh, distal femoral cortex. And another thing to bear in mind, and this is very important from, from the flexion point of view in particular, is the medial femoral condyle is bigger than the lateral. So when the knee is extended, that, that contributes to the valgus alignment of, of the knee, and in particular the valgus alignment of the femur. Um, but in uh, flexion, what that means is, is that relatively the, the, the femur will, will externally rotate, because in, in simple terms, the, the trochlea uh, and the femoral shaft as a whole is, is, is pushed into an externally rotating position, uh, because as the, the knee flexes, the, the posterior uh, medial femoral condyle will, will, will essentially push the femur on that side away from the, the tibia. And very quickly, um, of these two points here, the second one really is the relevant one, the fact that the, the tibial plateau, the native tibial plateau, is in, in three degrees of varus compared to the anatomical axis of the tibia. Uh, and again, that's important for, uh, to understand uh, flexion and balancing, and I'll show you a diagram of that as well. So again, here's the, the, the femoral, femur, well, sorry, the leg in its entirety. You can see there the anatomical axis passing all the way through the uh, center of the femoral head, the center of the knee, and the center of the ankle. If we zoom in a bit on that, then again, you can see the anatomical axis there. And you can see that the tibial plateau is sitting at about three degrees of varus compared with the anatomical axis, uh, sorry, the mechanical axis uh, of, the, of the tibia. What do we need the total knee replacement to be able to do after, after we finish our surgery? Uh, it needs to be able to rotate between 15 and 20 degrees. It should, as I've already mentioned, be a degree of uh, varus valgus laxity, uh, especially when the knee is in a slight degree of flexion. And in terms of how much flexion we need, uh, normal uh, ambulation requires about 65 degrees of flexion. Uh, if we're walking up a flight of stairs, that needs to be about 95 degrees. And to rise from a seated position, uh, you need really at least 110. And if you see patients who have less than that, your knees are stiff and they have limited flexion, they really do struggle to stand up and often have to, to kind of push themselves awkwardly to, to rise from a seated position. And clearly, there are certain religious and ethnic cohorts that require a deep, deeper level of flexion, and, and certain implants even have been designed specifically to try to account for that. So we need to understand all this uh, in order to, to make sure we get a, a good um, functional outcome and a symptomatic outcome from our, our new replacement. And really, I would say that the, the two key areas here are to optimize patellofemoral tracking and, and to get the, the soft tissue balancing right. And in the interest of time, I'm afraid I'm not going to go into detail uh, in patellofemoral tracking. Maybe we can talk a bit about that in uh, the afterwards discussion. I'm going to focus on the second of these points. Uh, and really to go back to what, what uh, the previous two speakers have, have said, what we therefore need to understand is both the bony anatomy and the principles of how to uh, balance the, the soft tissue uh, structures around the knee. And I remember somebody told me quite early on in my training that essentially a you know, knee replacement is, is a soft tissue operation in which you also happen to implant some bits of metal. And I think that's absolutely the right way to, to think about it. Um, Cash mentioned uh, the difference between measured resection uh, and gap balancing. I'm, I'm not going to go into lots of detail about that. My, my talk is mainly going to be on measured resection, but just to make sure that everybody understands what the difference is between those two. So the measured resection that, that Jay was, was talking about is essentially you use the bony anatomy to guide uh, how you make your, your cuts. 
uh, and particularly your various, well, the, the various valgus alignments of your, your, your femoral and distal femoral cuts and, and your, your proximal tibial cuts. Uh, and then once you're starting to put your implants in, you, you balance the soft tissues to that. So that, that's what, what Jay was talking about. The alternative is, is to do gap balancing where you use a tensioning device. And people sometimes talk about using this in uh, extension and deflection. To my mind, the, the key thing is really the, the role that it has in deflection. What it does is allow you to be accurate in terms of, of the amount of rotation you put onto your femoral components so that when the knee is flexed, the flexion gap uh, is, is really um, determined by the, uh, the soft tissues in that particular knee rather than just saying, I'm going to use the, the bony anatomy to tell me and then I'm going to try and uh, match the, the soft tissue releases to that. Um, restoration of the mechanical alignment of the femur. Okay, uh, so we really talked about the fact that body weight passes through the femoral heads, the center of the knee and the center of the ankle. Uh, and therefore, um, the, the, the bony cuts, uh, which are positioned perpendicular to the mechanical axis, um, should take account of that. And I, I mentioned the fact that the, so the distal femoral cut is, is, is normally in five to seven degrees of valgus. I mentioned the fact that if it's somebody like me, probably you're going to cut it in, in slightly less valgus. Uh, because my knee is probably uh, got less femoral valgus than somebody who's shorter. Um, and if we use an instrumentary rod, that's been show, shown to provide an adequate approximation towards anatomical axis. Uh, there was a, a question beforehand, uh, which maybe we'll come to in the discussion about the importance of uh, long leg alignment views. Um, but, but a lot of the time in, in total knee replacements, we, we do undertake a degree of approximation and most of the time that appears to give us a satisfactory result. On the tibial side, I've already mentioned the various alignments of the tibial plateau compared to the longitudinal axis. Uh, the tibial jig, whether we're using an intra or extra medullary jig, uh, cuts to the right angle to the anatomical axis. And essentially, the cut that we're making is actually in three degrees of valgus to the, to, to the native areas of, of the tibial plateau before the surgery started. Um, now, I already mentioned, and this is important to remember, that the medial femoral condyle is larger than the lateral, in particular that there's this greater degree of posterior condylar offset with the uh, lateral uh, femoral condyle than there is with the, the sorry, with the medial femoral condyle than there is with the lateral and normally in flexion to a degree the fact that the, the, the medial tibial condyle is sitting uh, inferiorly relative to the lateral accounts for that so that we don't get excessive medial tightness when the knee is flexed. Um, however because we're effectively slightly elevating the, the, the medial aspect of the tibial plateau because we're, we're making this 90 degree cut rather than an 87 degree cut this in theory uh, could put the, the medial collateral ligaments and the medial capsule under tension when the knee is flexed. And therefore, uh, the rule of thumb, if you like, if you base your assumption that the, uh, the soft tissue is balanced around the, the three degrees of varus of, of, the, of the native tibia, is that we put an extra three degrees uh, of, of external rotation onto the femoral component. And therefore, essentially, what we're doing is moving uh, the back of the, the medial femoral condyle a little bit away from the tibia and therefore we're, we're reducing the excessive tension that we would otherwise have in the uh in the medial side of the, of the joint and in, in simple terms we're, we're restoring what i would describe as the rectangularity of the flexion gap and therefore hopefully equalizing the degree of tension between the, the medial and lateral soft tissue structures so this is a, just a, a series of diagrams again to try and uh, describe that so you can see again as, as my previous diagram uh, the three degrees of various the proximal tibia uh, and you can see on the femoral side, when you look at the end of the femur in flexion, that the, the, the medial femoral condyle, uh, the offset is just slightly greater posteriorly. When we make our cuts, therefore, at 90 degrees, uh, we are slightly losing uh, some of the space for the, the, the back of the medial femoral condyle, and that can uh, create uh, excessive tension on the, the medial collateral ligaments and other structures. And therefore, as you can see, if we just dial in that extra three degrees of external rotation uh, when we make our femoral cuts, then we uh, now restore, hopefully, the balance in between the medial collateral ligaments and the lateral collateral ligaments. Uh, what are the ways that we can do to, to judge that? Well, uh, people talk about white sides line. Uh, the trans epicondylar axis is, is, is often described, although I'm always struck by the fact that trying to, to judge something to within one or two degrees by put, putting your, your index finger and your thumb onto two fairly large bony prominences on either side of the distal femur, both of which have soft tissue attachments, is probably fairly inaccurate um, uh, and that shouldn't be five to seven degrees so it should be three degrees of external rotation to the, the posterior condyles uh, and most jigs will, will, will have the opportunity to actually to have, have that specifically dialed in uh, so you have your, your, your paddles essentially sitting over uh, the back of the, the femoral condyles and then, and then you can choose uh, the, the implant so the, uh, the, the cutting block will allow you to decide uh, how much external rotation to, 
started. Bear in mind that in patients with very severe osteoarthritis, there may be not only significant cartilage loss, but even bone loss, and therefore the position of the native posterior femoral condyle uh, on one side of the knee may not be where it should, so one needs to factor that in uh, if you're using posterior condyles to determine the uh, degree of rotation that you're going to put the femoral components into. So here are just some diagrams to try and demonstrate that. So there's white side line, you can cut it 90 degrees to that. You can see the transit of the axis, uh, say, depending on your, your confidence and how accurately you can judge that. Uh, or you can put in your, your three degrees uh, relative to the, the posterior condylar axis there. What do we do if there's a fixed flexion deformity? Why do we get fixed flexion deformities in patients with osteoarthritis of the knee? Usually it's a combination of a contracture of the, the soft tissue envelope at the back of the knee, uh, and also the formation of, of posterior osteophytes. Uh, and so clearly our, our initial approach is going to be to try to correct both of those, but take the osteophytes off, uh, either using an osteotome or a bristo, and at the same time, if there are osteophytes there, um, strip them away. Um, if it's severe, you can either decide at the beginning of the operation or after you've done the, the, the other sections I've just talked about uh, to uh, it can protect extra distal femur at the beginning. Uh, so you may take away an extra two or even an extra four millimeters uh, when you're doing that. Uh, be careful though, if you're going to do that, not to overraise the, the joint line as that will potentially uh, affect the telefemoral kinematics. Uh, and occasionally you also need to release the, the posterior accoutre ligament if you're somebody who would normally be doing accoutre uh, retaining uh, knee replacement. Ligament balancing. Um, so as I said, this is really, to my mind, the most important part of the, of the knee replacement to get right. If you get this right, then there's a good chance that your patient will be in that, that 75 or 80 percent rather than the 20 to 25. Uh, and it's absolutely key to un understand how to achieve this. Um, bear in mind that in, in a diseased knee, uh, if somebody's got excessive amounts of osteoarthritic damage on one side, uh, soft tissues may be very lax on one side or very uh, tight. Uh, so we need to have, have strategies to try and uh, overcome that as, as we're doing the surgery. Having said which, in the vast majority of cases, certainly in my experience, I'll be interested to hear at the end what, what my, my fellow speakers uh, think about this. I would say that by the time you've made your bony cuts and done your, your basic surgical approach, as Jay elegantly outlined, uh, and you've removed your osteophytes, almost always uh, you've got a pretty good level of balancing already. And, and it's relatively rare, um, although not unheard of by any means, that you're, you're then having to do big amounts of extra releasing. Normally, the cases are going to require significant uh, extended serial uh, soft tissue releases. You would have identified that on the basis of both your uh, radiological imaging and your, your clinical examination findings before you've started. And then, you know, if you read the textbooks, and, and I'll, I'll probably go through these, um, you know, there's a sort of classical kind of insul described sequential releases. Um, I don't think this needs to be prescriptive. Do what, what feels right for you and do what, what, what seems in your hands in that particular knee replacement to be moving towards uh, you know, the correct balancing of both flexion and extension. So if it's tight medially, um, as I already said first, you check and reset any residual ossifites, uh, and then uh, as described, you go to a deep MCL first, release the posterior medial capsule, uh, potentially with the semi-membranosis as well, in particular if, uh, if uh, there's tight, tightness medially when it is extended. Uh, you can release the pes anterinus and then the superficial MCL and then the ECL comes last. Bear in mind that if you're doing this sequential releasing, um, you know, potentially you may end up then actually with, with, with laxity uh, where previously you had tightness, and so you need to, to have, have access to implants uh, if, if need be, uh, with a slightly greater level of constraint to account for this. Lateral side, again, um, you can all read. So again, we check the ossifites first, in particular on the femoral side, it's easy to miss those uh, on the lateral side. Um, do the posterior capsule, sorry, posterior lateral capsule release, uh, especially if it's tight. A um, good way to do that is, is to use a bristo, uh, and then you can kind of high crust along just uh, parallel with the, the back of the tibial plateau, uh, and that works probably pretty well. Uh, next step is release the ITB from the tubercle, pop the uh, and finally the lateral collateral ligament. And again, bear in mind you may need to, to increase your level of constraint depending on, on the level of laxity after you've, after you've done your, your releases. And then the final thing really to, to come on to is the importance of understanding how to optimize uh, both flexion and extension balancing. Um, so once you've done your medial lateral balancing, uh, the next thing, the final thing is to make sure that the, the gaps are, are equal in flexion and extension. And this is really important. So I guess if you take home something from this talk, then please, these next few slides, uh, try, try to kind of understand them and digest them. And I'm very happy to answer questions about it at the end. So if our knee is tight in extension, uh, but it's okay in flexion, everyone just have a quick think about, about how you'd approach that. What we're going to do is we're going to take more off the distal femur, 
Um, we, again, for the reasons I described before, we're going to be careful not to over elevate the joint line. Um, we may also uh, do some further release of the posterior femoral capsule, maybe release the PTL, but uh, we're going to retain the tibial resection height and we're going to retain the posterior condyle offset because by doing those two things, we're going to keep the satisfactory balancing that we've already achieved in flexion. So we're not going to change the height of the tibial cut and we're not going to change the posterior condyle offset, we're just going to move the femoral components essentially more proximally so that we've got adequate uh, balancing and extension as well as the adequate balancing we really have in flexion. I'm sorry to go through this fairly fast, I've got an eye on the time. What if it's the other way around? What if it's tight in flexion, but we're happy with it in extension? Well, then what we're going to do is we're going to downsize the femoral component. We talked already about the importance of, of referencing. So um, when, we're, when we're doing our, our femoral component downsize, um, we are going to take extra bone off the back of the, the femoral condyles. We're going to not take any more bone off the front because that, again, increases the risk of notching. So essentially, we're, we're doing a kind of anterior referencing by downsizing and cutting more off the, the, the back of the femoral condyles, but maintaining the amount of bone we're already resected in the front. Um, and we're not going to take anything extra off the tibia uh, because that way the extension gap will stay the same. Uh, actually, sorry, in, increase in flexion gap. That should be not extension, extension gap. So we're going to maintain uh, the extension gap by keeping the, the height of both components uh, in extension the same as it was, but by uh, reducing the posterior condylar offset, we're going to uh, reduce the tightness in flexion. Uh, and again, another thing that, that also to bear in mind, uh, although this is actually slightly more cumbersome to do, uh, but you can increase the posterior slope on a tibial component, uh, which again will reduce, reduce the tightness specifically as the knee flexes. Uh, and again, you need to understand exactly what the, the, the design features are of the particular system you're using in terms of how much uh, tibial slope is, is uh, possible to introduce. What if it's tied to both flexion and extension? Um, essentially, uh, if you're already on the, the thinnest bit of, of tibial poly that you can try, then you just need to increase the amount of tibial resection. So just lower the joint line down uh, and uh, you won't do anything to the femur at all. By doing this, you're going to uh, increase your extension gap and you're going to increase your flexion gap by the same amount. Um, one thing to bear in mind of, as, as, as the tibia kind of narrows down where, where, where it cones in uh, towards the uh, tibial tubercle, um, the surface area over which you can then implant your, your, your tibial component will, will reduce uh, because the diameter of the tibia narrows down. Uh, Satish was talking about the importance of, of not having excessive mismatch between uh, the femoral and tibial components. Again, that slightly depends on which system you're using. Some, uh, there's a greater level of flexibility than others in that regard. Um, but you essentially want to make sure you've got enough bony surface still to support your prosthesis. What do you do if it's lax in both flexion and extension? Then you do exactly the opposite. So you're, you're, you're trying to reduce both your flexion and your extension gap, and you're simply just going to upsize your, your tibial tray, and make sure you haven't cut so much off the bones in the first place that the, 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 uh, the thickest bit of, of, of polyethylene is, is insufficient. Uh, and if we do this, then we're going to reduce the extension gap and we're going to reduce the flexion gap by equal amounts, and therefore we're going to tension the medial and lateral soft tissue envelope throughout the range of motion. Okay. Uh, Cash, have I got time just quickly to go through the cases I put on the uh, the website? Or do you yes, want to please, please do. Okay, so uh, any of you who had the opportunity to look at the, the, the cases we stuck up before, uh, this is the one that I put on. So if we just imagine a, a 62-year-old gentleman, normally fit and well, uh, and, and to cut to the chase, I mean, he's essentially got uh, worsening osteoarthritic knee pain over the last five years or so. He's always been uh, slightly varus, um, but has been increasingly in, suffering from pain and the loss of function over the last five years. Uh, and has failed to respond to non-operative measurements, sorry, non-operative uh, uh, interventions. Uh, and um, when you examine him clinically, he's got pain and crevices throughout the arc of motion, got uh, a partially correctable varus deformity, but also quite a lot of uh, laxity on, on various stressing of the knee. And the patella, if anything, is slightly maltracking to the medial side. And these are his radiographs, so you can see a significant PFJ osteoarthritis, uh, we see a marked varus deformity and significant uh, degenerative change and, and some bone loss within the, the medial uh, side in particular. So the question I asked uh, people to consider um, was, uh, which of these would you choose? Medial unicondylar knee, crucial retaining, posterior stabilized, rotating hinge, fixed hinge, uh, or distal femoral endoprosthetic replacement. Um, and you know, clearly uh, you go into an operation having a, a plan beforehand, uh, but also bearing in mind that you, you need to have access to to, to, to interrupt the changes of plan. Um, and I would suggest that you, know, you could probably at least think of, of trying to, if you like, 
get away with the post who stabilized so to new replacement i think uh, the likelihood of having a, a functional pcl in, in that particular knee is, is fairly small and therefore i, I would certainly reach for post to stabilizers my my start at the 10 even though I, I normally try and use a cr if i can but i would also need to understand that a uh, combination of tightness and laxity that i've described on clinical examination may well mean we have to move to a rotating hinge so i would definitely have a more constrained device available to me before i started this gentleman's procedure fixed hinge really uh and to my mind have no place in anything other than uh the stage revision surgery where we might use it as a temporary spacer um the, the shear forces that are, are produced by a fixed hinge uh to my mind make it you know, un unfit for long-term use the distal femoral endoprosthetic replacement is, is, is clearly overkill. Uh, so we're doing the surgery, um, and during the trial, the knee is very tight medially, both flexion and extension. What would be uh, your choice of sequential soft tissue releases? Uh, so in the interest of time, I mean, if you've seen my previous slides, uh, according to the, the described sequence of events, it, it would be this. Uh, some of the other ones might work. Some of them are a complete nonsense. And once we've done our releases, then we trial again, and we now find that the knee is, is, is loose in both flexion and extension. And how, how can we correct that? Do we uh, increase the thickness and the pressure of the uh, femoral augments if we're using them, uh, both medially and laterally? Do we downsize the femoral component, increase the thickness of the polyethylene spacer? Do we upsize the femoral component, increase the thickness of the polyethylene inserts, switch to a stem prosthesis? Or do we try to placate the iliotibial band, band to reduce the pressure of lateral corner? laxity okay so for the reasons i've just described what we want to do in this case now is to reduce both the flexion and extension gap by equal amounts so we reach for a thicker piece of polyethylene uh all those other the first first three of those will have a, a degree of effect on either the flexion or extension balancing but, but not both at the same time stem prosthesis clearly has nothing whatsoever to do with the uh soft tissue balancing of the knee uh, and, and the last point is, is nonsense do we think that we would be likely to need augments in this case we say definitely not probably not maybe post to femoral augment uh, immediately uh, maybe a medial tibial condyle only or tibial condyles uh, on both sides medial tibial condyle medial post to femoral condyle okay and just to remind you that was what the x-ray looked like before we started so my my thought is is that we can see that there's there's definitely uh, a degree of bone loss there. We don't know that we're definitely going to have to use an augment, but it, it, you can probably try and work out. Uh, some of my maths isn't working, I'll show you on the hour, but you can see that the needle aspect of the tibial plateau looks like it probably eroded away to quite a degree, rather than excessively lowering the, the joint line in order to match up the medial and lateral tibial cuts. It might be possible to cut less off the lateral side and to put an augment to, to lift up the, the medial side and therefore keep the joint line in the correct position. Do we think the patellofemoral tracking is likely to be an issue definitely not probably not likely to maltrack medially likely to maltrack laterally i would say probably not so the reason this patient at the moment has, has medial maltracking of the uh of the pfj uh is because of the, the significant various uh instability and malalignment almost certainly once we correct that particularly if we understand where to put our components to optimize the telephone tracking it's likely that, that on its own will, will be adequate but it's certainly something we need to be particularly mindful of in this case and this is the end result of what we did. So, so by the time we'd done the, the media release required, uh, we found that there actually was a reasonable degree of laxity on the media side and, and, and no support whatsoever from the lateral side. So uh, having initially tried a posterior stabilized device and then a, a, a condylar, an increased level of condylar conformity, uh, still I wasn't confident with the level of stability. Uh, so you can see we did put a medial tibial augment in there uh, and then we used a, a, a rotating um, mobile bearing uh, device but, but with, with the hinge mechanism in it as well uh, and, and that's the end results so what are the take home points as i said at the beginning we need to understand the anatomical principles of both the native and the replaced uh, knee in order to try and recreate the biomechanics uh, and the function as, as much as any knee prosthesis uh, currently available allows us to do and when we make the bony cuts there are some compromises as long as we understand what those compromises are then we can match our, our soft tissue balancing to take those into account uh, an understanding of this is, is clear, clearly absolutely essential, both in terms of medial and lateral, and also infection extension gaps. And as we discussed at the beginning, what we're all striving for is a happy knee. If we have a happy knee, we'd like to have a happy patient. Thank you so much. Thanks, Seb. There, there's that, the, clearly a man has written a lot of MCQs in his time. <laughs> I promise yeah. I didn't just copy and paste the MCQ. No, no, as long as, no, you explained it very well. 
Seb, one question that I want to ask you that's come in is about your femoral distal um, valgus cut. You, you said five to seven degrees. Do you, what are, do you measure it preoperatively? No, I don't. And actually, when I saw, saw there was even a question about this beforehand, um, if you look through the literature, uh, lots of people have done a lot of work looking at you know, whether doing long leg alignment views beforehand uh, make any difference to the clinical outcome. You know, do, do they narrow your kind of level of kind of you know, outlying in terms of, of your component positioning afterwards? Uh, some of the studies show that it, it makes um, no difference at all to either the uh, alignment uh, or the uh, clinical results. Uh, some studies show that uh, you do reduce uh, kind of outliers in terms of your component positioning if you use uh, either long leg alignment views, CT scanograms, uh, plus minus computer navigation, etc. Um, there's very, very little evidence that, that, that shows that, that any of that makes a, a difference to the clinical outcome. And one of the questions after that is, well, what, why is that the case? And, mm. and, and we haven't had time for you to go into it, but we talked very much about, you know, some people are very much espousing now the idea of, of, of kinematic alignment rather than anatomical alignment. And it may be that that's, that's the, the reason for that. And, and that therefore, actually, if, if you're uh, understanding the principles of, of how to balance the knee, um, and, and again, you know, also perhaps to, to achieve a degree of compromise. So uh, if, if somebody's had a, a deformed knee for a prolonged period of time, uh, perhaps partly as a cause of their osteoarthritis in, in the first place, but, but partly also as a sequelae of it, it may be that the best result is not achieved clinically for that patient by, by trying to force them back into an absolutely uh, anatomically and inverted commas correct position. Uh, so no, I don't measure it beforehand. As I say, I mean, my only rule of thumb is that most of the time I, I just reach for six degrees as my, my kind of start for 10. Um, but if it's somebody very short or very tall, uh, I may uh, adjust that as a result. And also if someone has a significant variant deformity or a significant loudness deformity beforehand, that also may affect my, my choice of, of angulation. Thanks. And Seb, can I ask, what do you, you talked about your three degrees of external rotation and getting that appropriate. What do you do when you've got a hyperplastic lateral femoral condyle, as we often can see in a valgus knee? So, so those are the cases where I then, you know, having, having slightly rubbish the idea of the feeling for the times at the condyle axis, I, I, I would probably, I mean, normally I use the posterior condyles as my reference point for judging the femoral rotation. Um, but in somebody who has hyperplasia on one side or the other, uh, I then normally draw a white sides line on and I feel for the transepochondral axis and I try and you know, hope to myself that when I've done those two things that the, the resulting two lines look like they're roughly 90 degrees uh, to one another and then I reference off that instead. No, that's grand. Well, that's why I send you all, all my complex needs, so thanks. Jay, can I ask you a question? Um, we've, we're talking about uh, individualizing surgery. So um, if you want to just come off your mute at the moment, Jay, I want to ask you just about tibial slope. Yep. Do you tell me about how you adjust? Do you ever adjust the tibial slope? Um, because as a as a preliminary soft tissue knee surgeon on doing ACLs, I see lots of different tibial slopes on the yeah. sagittal view yeah. on this imaging. Yeah. Thank, thanks for asking that. It's a, it's a topic which I'm very particular about because the advantage of using a PS knee is that your flexion is completely independent of you giving the slope or not, all right? So a PS knee, the message would be, you don't truly need to recreate slope, right? So when I say I don't give slope, I don't add any slope. You know, when you put in your tibial jig, the yeah. teaching is that the lower part near the ankle is a bit out by three fingers, then you go to the middle of the tibia is two fingers and then down. And you're trying to recreate something. The answer is no. So every knee, I put it all the way back, right? But automatically, because you're pinning the top part of your jig onto the tibia, some degree of inherent slope would come in. But I don't add any slope to my jig, okay? That's there. Yeah. The reason is that it's, it's traditional teaching that we don't know where your front of your tibia is. And the patella tendon and the tibial fibrosity is really pushing your jig medially. We all agree, right? In real life, that's the problem. If you cut from the front of the tibia and it's a perfect cut, and then when you give your rotation, right? Rotation is going to be independent, then it's not an issue. But let's say we are not on the front of your tibia with your jig, and then you add your slope, right? And then you cut you're propagating or the mistake is more on your valgus varus, right? Yeah. So therefore, we don't have to use cut. And the next thing is, however, in a knee, I definitely don't give upslope. Okay, that's definitely a no-no. So I make sure I'm not upcutting. 
And in some knees, for example, because you're a PCL and ACL surgeon, Cash, you'll agree that I that from the evidence which has come out from soft tissue uh, anthropometric studies of the Arabic and the North African population, they have inherently more of a slope, right? Yeah. Yeah. And when I've done a few of my North African patients who I've seen, those are the ones where, if at all you're asking me, I'll make sure I don't upslope in them. I don't want to hit my stem hitting the cortex. Okay, so those are the yeah. ones I'm particular about. Okay. If And the next answer is those people who say I'm recreating three degrees and five degrees is very difficult, I believe, with non-robotics to recreate any particular slope. We know that from uni knees and it's the same in, in total knees. Thank you. Jay, while you're here, I've got one more question about PS. Yes. Yeah. always gets people excited. Rohit Signal wants to know, what, what are your views on, on the idea that the PS knee may be more constrained than the CR knee? Yeah, good question again. That's why I said that in your when you're going up, don't you like Seb correctly said, I know he's a fantastic surgeon and he does CR knees, right? So even in very deformed knees, he would be doing a CR. So the in the implant philosophy, the stability of your implant by the post is only offered at 70 degree of flexion and above, right? That's where the cam engages the post. Okay. Hence. If you're asking that, can you get your inherent stability by an extension for medial lateral problem? The answer is you cannot. So you're fooling yourself by saying your PS is giving you that stability because it's only giving it. And in true uh, biomechanical terms, constraint is more anterior posterior rather than true only medial lateral. But the message is that the medial lateral stability is not given in extension. So the answer is definitely not. You cannot fool yourself as giving you more stability. So it's not more constrained. Brilliant. Thank you, Jay. And Satish, um, one question that came in was asking about vitamin D in arthroplasty, checking it pre-op, optimizing it post-op. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, the, there's some evidence, I think, in the Asian population that if you optimize them, the outcomes are better. Uh, so I, I don't get any Asian pop, uh, patients here yet. So I haven't routinely checked. Okay. I, I must say, it's interesting. It's something that I've been checking more and more over the last few years. I don't do it for every patient, but uh, I do find it's um, quite an issue. I, I found out I've got low vitamin D as well. So I started yeah. taking it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> can I ask the panel one last question to finish up? The question that's come up again, can, someone, can you please clarify the difference between a mechanically and kinematically aligned knee? So would anyone like to take that as our last question? I mean, I, I mean, if, can I go, Seb and Sadish, just to start? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I think the main answer is that in a mechanically aligned knee, you're working on what Seb and me and Sadish have said, that you're working on the assumption that when you cut your tibia, you have to get it 90 degrees to the long axis. All right, that's your mechanical axis, and you're putting your tibial component 90 degrees to that. And that's how we traditionally do knees if you're not using robotics. So let's say I traditionally put my knee in I will use my jig to get that. And hence, if you're doing kinematics knees, you're gonna get what that patient's kinematic is. And I find that I coming to three degrees and four degrees of trying to reproduce something on conventional jigs, practically, I don't think we can do, All right? So I think it's a non-starter to a degree if you're doing traditional jigging. That'll be my straightforward answer. I, I think that's right as well. Uh, <clears throat> so. Really, I mean, yes, some of the companies now are starting to market uh, in a software that, uh, you know, if you're using either uh, navigated surgery or, or robotic surgery, uh, they will you know, try and do kind of functional scans, whether it's kind of MRI scans or CT scans or whatever, yeah. that, that looks at, at where the, the, the femur and the tibia are sitting relative to one another uh, in, in different uh, sort of points of, of either the gait cycle or, or, or you know, the knee flexing and extending. Uh, and the idea then is that, that that's, that's meant to allow surgical planning of, of where the cuts are made for that particular patient to, to reflect the kind of kinematic function of, 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 of the knee. Um, and I, I agree with Jay. Uh, I mean, A, uh, you know, no, nobody to my mind has, has really shown unequivocally yet that that gives you a better outcome, although, you know, logically it, it might do. And that could go back to the point I was making before about the evidence for and against trying to do long leg alignment views and so on. Um, but uh, really uh, using you know, conventional knee replacement uh, instrumentation, I don't think it's possible to, to, yeah. to try to achieve that. The non-starter. No, that's great. And also, I'm, I'm glad we haven't talked about patella because it's the bane of my life. Um, the Listen, on that note, I think we'll round things up. Um, the recording of this webinar will be made available um, on the YouTube um, channel 
on our website, on the OIUK website tomorrow. Uh, we will have some case takeaways, as you know, we're used to filming the two minute uh, summaries, um, which will go on the next few days. I will do a podcast on this, but Bates knows nothing about knee replacement. Um, <laughs> if you guys have any suggestions or any wishes for any future sessions, please do let us know via the website or Twitter. I'm very grateful to you all for making time with us this evening. I'd like to thank the panel. Generally a fantastic se session. I've really enjoyed it. And it's given me plenty of food for thought as well. So I'm going to start doing more, more PSs, but I think the thing to do for now is just stick to unis. Okay. On that note, thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Gash. Thanks, 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 everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Mike. you all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Okay, so we're just going to end the session now. And if the panel just check your emails, there's a link to the next uh, Zoom meeting just to have a debrief. And thanks everyone for attending. Thank you. <laughs>